Welcome to Emergency Chaos, where we provide tips and tricks to make you a better ER nurse. Today, we are going over the key points of a sepsis workup, including what it is, the symptoms, the workup itself, and specific nursing tips. Thank you for watching. So, sepsis is characterized by an infection in the body's unregulated reaction to that infection. What makes sepsis deadly is that it can eventually lead to multi-organ dysfunction and death. So, the purpose of, seps of the sepsis workup is to locate the infection and figure out how sick the patient is. For example, is the patient already in organ dysfunction or are they still early on in the process? This is important to determine as it gives a sense of the patient's prognosis and determines how aggressive the team needs to be with interventions. Now, let's shift our focus towards symptoms because as an ER nurse, you need to be able to recognize the patients who are uh, septic. Although I understand that guidelines are changing, many organizations still use SERS criteria. As we know, sepsis is characterized by an infection or a suspected infection and an unregulated immune response, or again, in other words, SERS. So the patient comes into the ER and you suspect they're having an infection, you need to also go over the SERS criteria to help assess whether the patient is septic and ultimately ensure their place as a priority. SERS criteria has four components, three of which you can do in triage. They include a temperature greater than 100.4 Fahrenheit or less than 96.8 Fahrenheit, a heart rate greater than 90, a respiratory rate greater than 20, and finally, a white blood cell count greater than 12,000 or less than 4,000. Again, when a patient comes into the ER and you suspect they're having an infection, you also need to go over the source criteria to make sure that you place them as a priority to be seen next to get attention first in just in case they are septic. Now, for specific symptoms that may indicate an infection, include being febrile, tachycardic, tachypnic, and so forth. Again, these do not automatically mean that the patient has an infection. However, they can help guide the evaluation of the patient. For example, if the patient is febrile, tachycardic, has abdominal pain and green stools, it can help point the team in the right direction regarding the workup. Now, as far as the workup, however, keep in mind that the most likely sources of infection for septic patients are from the lungs, the abdomen, and the urinary system. So the CBC with the differential will let us know the white count, what type of white blood cells are elevated, and whether a shift is present. The CMP will let us assess organ dysfunction and derangements as a result of the infection in the body's response. The urinalysis will allow us to see if there is an infection in the urine, and the urine culture will help us figure out which antibiotic is most effective. The blood cultures will help us detect whether bacteria is pre present in the bloodstream and figure out which antibiotic is most effective. The same principle will apply to to wherever you obtain a culture from, whether it's a sputum, a wound, or even any type of tube or drain that's coming out of the patient. Now, the lactate gives us an understanding of the patient's perfusion status, whether the tissues throughout the body are getting the oxygen they need. Typically, the higher the lactate, the higher the mortality rate is. It's also useful to trend because if you repeat the lactate after your initial interventions, like the fluid and the lactate came down, you can gauge that your interventions are working. The team may also start ordering additional lab tests like inflammatory markers and a DIC panel. Inflammatory markers like procalcitonin help determine the level of inflammation throughout the body. The higher the level, the higher the inflammation. The DIC panel will let us know if clotting factors are being consumed throughout the body and signal whether they have to be replaced. The main thing that I want you to remember is source control. Finding the source of the infection is crucial, especially when we keep trying everything in the part and the patient is showing no signs of improvement. We need to address the source. The worst outcomes that I've seen is when we are unable to find the source. So is it coming from a skin infection somewhere in the body? Have you turned them? Have you looked everywhere? Is it possibly coming from the Foley, from a central line, from a PIC line, from a nephrostomy tube, from the dialysis catheter? You have to find that infection, right? Next, so the chest x-ray will help us figure out if their patient has pneumonia or any other condition that may be causing the patient's symptoms. The same for the CT. It's going to help us find the source or perhaps help find the cause of the patient's system symptoms. The LP will help us assess for an infection in the CSF if the patient is showing meningeal signs or even to roll out when the rest of the workup is inconclusive. 
Now, let's go over the treatments. But super quick, I want to say thank you for watching this far. If you would like to further support the channel, please consider becoming a member. It is $1 per month and it goes to helping ensure I am able to create more videos like this on a regular basis. Again, thank you so much. Now, back to the general treatment. As soon as the diagnosis is made or even when there is a high suspicion of an infection being present, antibiotics need to be administered. Start off with broad spectrum antibiotics, then more targeted towards the potential source. Then when the results of the cultures come back, the antibiotics will be specific towards the offending agent. From my understanding, the faster antibiotics are given, the better the outcomes. Next, fluids should be also administered, especially when the patient is hypotensive, tacky, and with a high lactate. Typically, normal saline or LR are preferred. Usually, initially, it is 30 ml per kilogram in adults and 20 ml per kg in uh, pediatric patients. Remember, just remember to adjust your dosing when patients have congestive heart failure. If fluids did not help with the, with the infection, with an infection, vasopressors can also be considered, right? So if the fluids did not bring up the BP a little bit in your septic patients, vasopressors are also going to be considered. The first line presser for sepsis is going to be norepinephrine, then most likely vasopressin from what I've seen. You will also be managing any derangements and abnormalities as a result of the sepsis. And the team may consider glucocorticoids when the fluids and pressure did not help with the improving perfusion, as they are thought to help with adrenal insufficiency when the patient is very critically ill. Now, for specific nursing tips, remember to keep in mind the search criteria when triaging patients with a sus suspected source of infection. Remember to always, always obtain blood cultures prior to antibiotics. Your facility may employ specific time bundles, such as obtaining blood cultures, a lactate, giving fluids and antibiotics in a certain time frame from the patient arrival. This is just to ensure that there is no delay in the treatment of septic patients, but just become familiar with their organization's protocols. Remember that norepinephrine is typically the first agent in sepsis and that it can go peripherally initially. If you do use it, remember that you need to put in a large bore IV in the AC if possible. Again, norepi will be the first line agent. And if you didn't use it peripherally initially, you can just make sure you get an okay from your providers and that you do a, you place a large bore IV. And finally, which is extremely important is to closely monitor your patient to ensure the interventions are working. And if not, that you're timely communicating with the team. Thank you so much for watching. I would really appreciate a like and a follow. And if you learned something today and would like to help support the channel, please consider getting the mini book I put together on Amazon. The link will be in a pinned comment below. As always, you should continue nurturing your curiosity and continue learning daily. With that in mind, please watch my other videos. And I've also listed my favorite ER nursing related books in the description text and in the comments as well. So when you get a chance, please check them out. And if you've learned something recently while at work that may be helpful to other new ER nurses, please consider sharing it in the comments so that we can all benefit and help each other out. Thank you. And as always, teamwork makes the dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive.